I don't know how long this will last, but this is fun. I have my utmost for his highest, and we're going to be doing utmost videos that are really challenging and kind of hitting you right where it counts, you know, and meeting the rubber meets the road and where your life interjects and intersects with God's will for you and whether or not you do something about what you've heard, what you've seen, what you've handled in watching this video, much less what you're doing in your own personal life today. So it is confrontational in a way and conformable in a means, but the reality is it's up to you to do what you hear and what you see on these videos. So in video, my utmost, or in my utmost videos, <laughs> I was thrilled when I read this because it was uh, I believe what we're going to speak on in the New Year's Eve message, which is going to be exciting. I'm looking forward to it. It'll be rather long. <laughs> and we may break it up into segments, but you know, it'll be I think I'm gonna do it out here, you know, and maybe light up the entire the entire porch and try to get some lights out here and do something special about it. And it'd be fun, you know. It's my first video for New Year's. But anyways, where the battle is lost or won. If you will return, O Israel, says the Lord in Jeremiah 4 1. Our battle is first won or lost in the secret places of our will, in God's presence, never in full view of the world. One of the things that I do, that I've been reminding people of consistently, persistently, and over and over and over again, is the very aspect of the idea that what you say is what you are. What comes out of the abundance of the heart and what your mouth speaks is who you are, as far as God is concerned. Because he says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So you reveal who you are by what you say, by what you're doing, by the very words you're using. So you need to pull back. You need to stop talking long enough to find out what it is you're saying with your words. In other words, shut up. Quit being a blabbermouth. Go back before you open your mouth. Speak alone, one-on-one -on -one with God. Stop all conversation with every other person until you have first had a personal relationship and conversation with God about what you're saying. Because you see, you are causing people to stumble. You are. You're throwing out there your words and Jesus said in the multitude of words there lacks not sin. So how many words have you written today? How many words have you spoken and not talk to God about first. Think about it. I'll give you time. It's over. You done? How many? You see, our society has been one of hype, 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 roll, 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 run, 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 hamster cage, hamster cage, do it again, do it again, run in a circle, run in a circle, and run off the mouth as it runs through the mind, and now we have the internet where people aren't thinking before they type. They aren't thinking before they text. They aren't even thinking before they open their mouth. And Jesus said that the tongue was the most devastating of all instruments with which we live and breathe and have our being. If this thing, our words, is so real that Jesus warned us about them, maybe you better shut up. Maybe you better stop what you're doing. I think you better evaluate again what the scriptures say as opposed to what the world says. Because, let's be real. Where do you live? When you go into work, do you just pop off with your mouth whatever you think that your boss doesn't want to hear? Do you just tell him that he's stupid or he's not smart? That he's wearing something ugly? That he's not doing his job? That you don't think you're appreciated? Do you? just automatically vent all the feelings that you have inside to him and you can just throw it out there at him and it's just going to splash like a wall off him and not affect you? Really? So what do you think God thinks about what we do in our private life? What do you think God thinks about 
what we do in our public life. What do you think you're doing to people around you by your words not matching your faith and not being full of the life-giving process that God's Word of God is? Because you see, the Word of God is supposed to be life-giving. It is sharper than a two-edged sword and it's able to cut asunder from the bone from the marrow and to be a discerner of the intents and the hearts of men and women. And if you know how to understand the Word of God, then you listen carefully to what people say. And because the Word of God says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, then all you've got to do really to find out what a person is or to know wisdom is to listen. But see, the first part would be you have to recognize the Bible said what it means. It means what it says. It means it's true that you can know what a person is thinking if you listen to what they're saying. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's the way it works. It's not easy. That's why it's called the utmost. People like to, nowadays, tell me about our founding fathers. I'd like to know about the founding faith that they have. You see, the founding fathers didn't have this founding faith that everybody thinks they had. They had a lot of vernacular without the ramifications of people being around them to record everything they were saying and doing. Where God records conversations that are directly quotations from his inspiration telling writers what was said at the time. So I take our founding faith and those conversations more serious than our founding fathers. But even in our foundation and our founding fathers, let's look at the realization of what we're saying. <clears throat> we're saying that we want to follow in their example. So if you're one of those kind of people, which I'm not, and you want to follow the founding fathers, then arrange your conversation because that's the way they spoke in those days. In the 1700s, it was the gentleman's duty to speak in honorable terms or he could be challenged to a duel and die. Those are how serious the words were with which you chose to speak or to remain silent. That has been the articulation that was presented before kings even as early as 1600s when we were still under the monarchy and even farther back as you look through each century of generations that articulated meaning they spoke in a certain way because they knew that it could cost them their life if they spoke in a wrong way they misspoke nowadays we see in the modern 20th century somehow this abuse of words where we're saying what we don't mean and not meaning what we said not saying yes means yes or no means no but oh well yesterday I said yes but I misspoke yesterday I said no but I, I didn't understand the full consequences or the ramifications of the situation so now that I understand all of it I need to change that no to yes oh I can't honor that commitment or that contract because at that time I thought I was right but now that I'm wrong I have to go ahead and change my mind because after all I'm changing the direction that I'm going because you know I, that wife or that husband you know isn't uh, you know the contract that I can honor now and I have to change that contract and dissolve it how serious are you about your words how serious you are how serious are you about cleaning up your life how serious are you about walking with God? Because if you're not serious, don't watch the video. That's the bottom line. My utmost videos are about my utmost for its highest. That means we're going to set the bar higher. We're not going to settle for the standard of living that right now currently is poverty as far as spiritual poverty is concerned in this nation. We want to raise the standard of living so that we all enjoy the fellowship and the fruit of the Spirit, which is peace, love, and joy. In order to get there, we got to get rid of some of the flesh. We got to get real with ourselves. We got to start knocking down these barriers that have separated us and have caused us to separate ourselves and segregate into private little communities that are acting like their own little fiefdoms that somehow they've got a king and they've got a prince and they got this and they got attitude 
and they got action, they got clothes, and they got deeds, and they got words, and they have absolutely no reality when it comes to the spiritual things of God, when it comes to the Word of God and how it applies to their life. So in my utmost vidivos, we're going to look at it. There are no divas in spirituality. I'm sorry. Jesus Christ is our example. And you won't like what he has to say because he does not leave his disciples alone. He challenges them every single time that pride raised itself up. He smashed it down because if anyone wanted to be great, they had to become the least. And if you can come to me and tell me that I'm wrong about these scriptures, then please do. Because I would love to hear from you. I don't mind. People call me and tell me all the time that I'm full of pride. Oh, he's so prideful. He's got this ego that just won't quit because he says the word of God and then he acts like he knows what it means. <laughs> it means what it says. It says what it means. I guess I don't really have to know. I just have to say it. And then all of a sudden I'm in trouble because I'm full of pride. Okay. <laughs> the point is this. If you want to grow and you want to go with God farther than you've ever been before, then you've got to pay the utmost farthing. You have to go the distance. You have to ask yourself, am I denying myself taking up my cross and following Jesus? Because if you're not, go away. Go go back to pamper school and diapers and play with, you know, the toys and the sandbox and enjoy your time that God has given you in order to do that which you want to do. Don't pretend you're something you're not. Men requite themselves as men. That means they stand up. First of all, they take a stand. But then if they make a, make a wrong choice, they admit it. They take the consequences of their choice and account for themselves as being wrong. And they say, I blew it. I'll pay it. Whatever I did, I'll do it. I was wrong. I need to make recompense. I need to pay up my debt. I need to be responsible. I need to be accountable. I need to move in that area of my life that says to me that since I can't do it myself, I need you to help me do it. And that's the reality of utmost. Because on the utmost, we could just kind of read these little devotionals and pretend like, ah, oh, yeah, it sounds good on Sunday, but we ain't going to do it on Monday. <laughs> Matter of fact, we'll get away with it all the way till Friday, and then maybe Saturday we'll think about it, and Sunday we'll be ready to repent. And then move forward again. We'll repent it. We're going to go forward. And then by Sunday afternoon, we're already back into the football game and doing what we want to do. Count the cost. I'm telling you straight up. Count the cost. This is utmost video number one. We're going a long ways. And if you're going with me, you'll be changed. There's no doubt about it. The Holy Spirit has promised that he will invade your life, rearrange, challenge you, create in you a clean heart. He will design it so that you will be busted big time. But requite yourself as a man. Act like it. Grow up. Mature. Become a man of God. Become what you wanted to be, even though you think you're already there. Now, let's see if you really know what a man of God is. Because that's what we're going to do in Utmost Video. We're going to challenge each other. In one year, we will be prepared for the coming of the Lord. Why? Because we will have allowed this gritty, grimy, Lots of go for guts, mutilated monkeys, meat, chopped up little birdies' feet to just chew us up and spit us out and become spiritual beings. This utmost will become our handbook. And I recommend highly that in video utmost, you go out and get one. Now, don't don't mess around, man. Don't don't even waste your time. If you're not into it, go away. Don't waste your time. Your time is precious. You don't have much of it left. Go back to what you're doing. Go where you want to go. Do what you want to do. Seek the Lord while you can. Find him. But guess what? We're busy. Those who want to move on in utmost and want to go forward in a way that they've never known God before and discover Jesus in a personal, intimate way that they want to have a relationship with him in everything and in their ways present to themselves the idea that they have done all that they can to lay down their lives before the Lord, before he returns, then I would say, get a book. Utmost for his highest. This one's written in English, so if you want an English kind of sounding one, it's unabridged, so it's kind of like easy to read. Now I have my utmost for his highest, and you can go to any 99 cent store. No, actually, you have to go to a used store 
and look in the Christian book section, and there'll be one, and you'll find one. These are throwaways. They, you know, I bought this one for 99 cents. 99 or 59 cents. 99 cents. And you can find them everywhere. It doesn't cost any money. Go get one. You're going to need it. Because if you're going to go forward, if you're going to grow up, then you got to pay the price. you got to count the cost of what it's going to cost you personally to become a man of God. As far as boys are concerned with their toys, I'm not interested. As far as you and your man cave, I'm not interested. As far as you and your diva attitude or your pride or your ego, go away. You know, if you got football games and you got football scores to share and all that other junk to do, I don't care. I'm not interested. I don't have time to waste. The Lord is coming. Yes, he's not coming in 2012, so you've got about a year to kind of, you know, get this together. But I don't have time to waste. I know what a sinful creature that I am, and I know years and enough time to straighten up my act, so guess what? I've been working on this thing for about 35 years, and I still need to keep going, and I want to keep pressing on and press into the measure of the fullness of the... Press into the fullness of the measure of the Son of God in me so that I would fulfill all the destiny that he has for me so that I would be accomplishing that which he wanted to do in me in all those years that I wasted in order to get to this place that I am now. How about you? Don't you want to do the same? Our battles are first won or lost in the secret places of our will in God's presence, never in the full view of the world. You've got to get alone, get right, get on with it. In other words, whatever it is, you go to God first. It doesn't matter. If you got an attitude against someone, you stop, you will up, you just turn your back, grab your forehead, whatever, close your eyes, doesn't matter, and say, God, i got to change this attitude. Lord, you've got to help me. Turn it over to the Lord. Immediately. Don't wait till you go home. Don't wait till you're somewhere else. you got a problem with your wife? Stop. Stop. Shut up. Don't do anything. Back away carefully. Walk away circumferentially. <laughs> it means around in a circle. Circle it. And then get somewhere and go in the bathroom. Everybody has an excuse to go to the bathroom. Pardon me? Uh, I, wait a minute. Hold that thought. I got to go. And you run to the bathroom and you take your five second, whatever, ten minute time, sit down, pretend like you have a bowel movement. I don't care how you do it. Whatever you do. Go to the bathroom. Get right with God before you open your mouth. Talk to him about it. Whatever comes out next, then you can blame it on the Holy Spirit. That you can do. You can always turn to God and ask him to take over and to take control and to use you in the way that he wants to. And then you can blame him if it doesn't turn out the way you think. You really can. That's what I did. It works. I'm just giving you some tips. But the point is this. God doesn't want you doing anything unless you checked in with him first. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. All thy ways. In everything you have to start doing that everything bring every thought into captivity of Christ all the words of thy mouth may it be pleasing in thy sight O Lord the words of my mouth the attitude of my heart the thoughts that I think what do you think's not covered everything you can't take hell into heaven you got to change what's inside that hellacious person that you are become heavenly capable so that you won't self-destruct when you wind up in heaven Otherwise, you're going to wind up completely annihilated because hell cannot exist in heaven. And you, as a corrupted being, cannot exist in an incorruptible environment. That's just the way it is. So God wants you, as a practical reality, to first stop what you're doing and get away from the world. Don't let anyone know. Don't make a prayer list about it. Don't make a prayer request. Don't make a whatever. Get alone with God, one-on-one. -on -one. It's not about what you can tell everyone, beg everyone, plead with everyone, get sympathy from everyone, and have hands laid this day and everything else done on you in order for you to get it through your thick skull that you need to grow up. Now, it's a one-on-one. -on -one. It's your utmost. It's all that you are. It's time for you to grow up. It's time to be a man. The Spirit of God seizes me and I am compelled to get alone with God and fight the battle before him. you got to get your will out of it and put his will in it. And the only way to do it is to find out what it is in the first place. Think about that. What is his will in every circumstance? It's not about taking a Bible and saying, 
Well, I know the word of God, so I know that uh, given that this is sinful here and this is not so sinful, <coughs> and I'm going to act like a judge. <coughs> Can't make my voice do that anymore. And I'm going to render a verdict upon these two situations. I'm going to decide that Yoda, yeah, he knows. No, but anyways, the reality of the circumstances are that you don't know what the circumstances are. Man looks on the outward things. God looks on the heart. Every single circumstance you run into in your life is going to be completely different. God is not always going to do the same thing exactly the same every time that you run into something different. Because every time that you run into the same thing over and over again, it's not going to be the same thing. It's different. It's going to involve unique personalities and people that God wants to bring something out and bring to the circumstances of the situation something that He can see, you cannot. You must, over and over again, remind yourself of this. That's why you should have the book. Underline it. Write it down. Write it on your forehead. Whatever you want to do about it. But you've got to allow the Spirit of God to seize you and compel you to get alone with God and fight the battle before Him alone so you have it over with before it happens. People wonder, how come they go, hey, how come, how come you got the right word to say to the people when they you know, ask you these questions? Or how come you got the right thing to say whenever you do? You say, I don't. <laughs> that simple. Flat out. I don't. I don't open my mouth until I go, Lord, it's time. <laughs> And then it's hammer time. Hammer God. You know, God takes over and he does his thing. And I go, <laughs> well, I look so smart. <laughs> I don't take credit, God. But the point is, is that you're not supposed to have intelligence. You're not supposed to know it all. You're supposed to be turning it over all to him. You're not supposed to be the expert. He is supposed to be the expert. Remember, spiritual realities are different. They're the opposite of physical realities. Physical reality, whatever you may think it is, Physical wisdom, earthly wisdom, flip it upside down. Put it back on God, and you got it. Won't be a problem then. It's a reverse polarity of any way of your way of thinking. If you think that educating yourself is going to put you into the right circumstances of the situation, then you've completely missed the boat with what the Spirit of God is saying to you in utmost. Utmost is always going to turn you back to the reality of Jesus. Otherwise, it's going to say, you failed, over, done, sorry, start again. The Spirit of God seizes me and I'm compelled to get alone with God and fight the battle before Him. Until I do this, I will lose every time. One of the biggest self-deceptions that I see in Christianity today is that the person thinks they won because they made a point and then they ran off before they had to get along. What if God said, hey, I don't care what the point is, I care if you get along. I care if you're still with that person when you get done arguing about it. I care whether or not you have served that person. I care if you loved that person. I care more about that person, maybe, than I care about you being right. Have you not read? Is it not in the scriptures that you can be made wrong in order for him to be made right? That every man be called a liar, but God be found true? Haven't you read that? It's not about being righteous. It's about being a man with God so you can become a man of God. The battle may take one minute or one year, but that will depend on me, not God. The battle is your will. Will you do what he wants you to in that given circumstance? Most of you won't. Even I at times, I ain't doing that. I'll turn around and go the other way. And then it takes me another set of circumstances and maybe another and maybe a year down the road. I finally get to the point where I go, Okay, God, I get it. You know, I've been here before. I didn't do it that way. I've been here before. I didn't do it. Didn't want to. Now I'm facing it again. I guess we're going to do it. It's up to you. Get it right the first time. No problem. Don't get it right. Guess what? You're going to do it over and over and over again until you get it. However long it takes, I must wrestle with it alone before God, and I must resolve to go through the hell of renunciation or rejection before him. Nothing has any power over someone who has fought the battle before God and won there. Nothing has any power over the someone who has fought the battle before God and won there. 
People have asked me, how come you know, I can go ahead and just keep you know, reiterating on the circumstances or take some expose or do something in Bible studies in some reality where a person is confronting me and trying to you know, either chastise me, bring me down, or attack me in some way, and I don't ever respond to it, but I always bring them back to the reality of the relationship with Jesus and a personal expectation of God to speak to them and then the realization of God in them so that they could come to the conclusion that either they have God or they don't have God so that that way their salvation is assured and they know that they can do whatever it is that God tells them to do in that way that he has provided for them by his spirit. So how does that all come about? It's because right there, Chambers said it. Pretty simple. Fought the battle before God and won there. The battle is never about what the person is saying to you or even the battle is about what you're doing. It's really a battle of your own will about what you're determined to do in the first place, whether you're going to accomplish God's will or not. If I'm going into any set of circumstances and I know that the focus is Jesus, 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 and a relationship with Him, what do I got to argue about? Everything I can turn back to, the personal relationship with God, what did God tell you to do? Did God tell you to do that? If He didn't tell you to do that, why are you doing that? If you're not doing that, then how come you're not doing that? Because He told you to do that. If He didn't tell you to do that, then why are you doing what you're doing if He didn't tell you to do that? And then if you're doing that, then why didn't He work out? Because if He told you to do that, then it should have been the way that He said it does. What did He say to you to do? Very simple. It all boils down to the simplistic, not the confusing. If you want to grow up, you got to get down the basics. The basics are there. Relationship, relationship, relationship. It's got to be with it. It's got to be a relationship. You got to have a personal conversation with God. What are you fighting about? If you don't have one, stop what you're doing. Get one. It boils down to that. If you don't know how, start buying books. If you really don't, and you've watched all these videos that I've already posted and already placed out there, you know, in order for you to understand and don't get an idea that you're supposed to have a personal relationship with God, I guess I failed then you need to get a grip on it and go find out whatever it is that God can speak to you in. Because if he can't speak to you through the videos that have been telling you over and over and over again through reading your devotionals, if it fits the pieces of the puzzle fit together and they coordinate and they seem to fit your circumstances and the circumstances of your life have already worked out so that God knew writing in that book that you would be reading it on that day that circumstances you're reading about, then guess what? That's God speaking to you. Then how dumb can you be? But... That's not where it ends. That's where it begins. You keep going. God wants to speak to you audibly. He wants to speak to you personally. He wants to use more than circumstances to work with you. He wants to talk to you. He wants you to have a personal conversation with him so that you're rapping with him and talking with him every day of your life. Constantly. That's what it means to continue in prayer. Prayer is conversation. Whether you know it or not, you're going to discover that if you continue on in doing this in the videos. I should never say I will wait for circumstances and then I'll put God to the test. Trying to do that will not work. I must first get the issue settled before God and myself in the secret places of my soul where no one else can interfere. Then I go ahead knowing that with certainty that the battle is won. If you lose it there and calamity and disaster and defeat before the world are as sure as the laws of God. In other words, you're never going to accomplish anything in the ministry if you don't first accomplish the war within your soul. The attitude of your heart. The reactions you have when people attack you, challenge you, make you, motivate you, or somehow come at you in some way that you haven't already prepared for ahead of time. You have to know from the moment you wake up in the morning that every single circumstance of your life is directed by God or else don't go where you want to go, but go back to the basics and learn who God is, what God is, and how God lives in you and wants to speak to you and wants to talk to you, wants to fellowship with you. Don't go to utmost because you're still dealing with the least most and you're still going to come up with some most of what you need to do before you get to a place of growing up and maturing in the body of believers and becoming into ministry. Men of God are in ministry. That's what makes them men. If you're not in ministry, then you failed in what God told you to do from the beginning, which was to go out and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to make disciples of all nations so that they would be growing up into becoming the men of God that they were supposed to be, and to share the gospel that you would declare to, to the nations that they would be those that would be saved, those that wouldn't be saved, that there is a heaven and there is a hell and that there's eternal damnation or there's eternal salvation. So if you're not already knowing of that and you haven't done those things and learned how to present them before, that's just simply your testimony and sharing that which the word is written already in the book, then guess what? Go back to the basics and start over again. Because utmost will kill you. But 
Blessed are you if you do those things and not a hearer only. So you've got to be doing something, and that doing is what the ministry is all about. Your life is a ministry. That's how simple it is. Whatever it is you're doing is the ministry. The reason the battle is lost is that I fight it first in the external world rather than get alone with God and do battle before him and settle the matter once and for all. Every failure you have is a failure to be real with God and get real with him. If you haven't taken the time to become real with him, you are not going to progress any farther until you have gotten that through your thick skull that God is a living God, that God is that God is that God does miracles and not just the kind that heals, you know, slaps you on the back and knocks you down and makes you roll around on the ground. No, God deals in a real world. You know, somebody walks up to you and wants to hit you or something, you know, and he stops them. God brings people into your life that, you know, want to pull a trigger and a gun won't fire. God brings things into your circumstances of life that he can even bring down fire from heaven and parts of the Red Sea if he wanted to and if you want to. And if you really wanted to go out there and prove it to yourself, go ahead and try. Sometimes it might happen, sometimes it might not. It depends on what God wants to teach you at the time. So the reality of what you're saying when you tell me about what could God do or what can't God do, or would God do this if you were put in circumstances, is the stupidest thing that I ever heard of. When people tell me that, what would you do if, you know, some gang member or some person came walking up and wanted to shoot you or wanted to assault your wife or something, I say, hey, have at it. The Lord brought you here. He's telling you to do something. I think he wants you to hear what I have to say, so I'm going to go ahead and share it with you anyways while you're doing whatever it is that you think you're going to do because God's going to stop you from doing it because I'm going to go ahead and tell you all about the gospel anyways. You get it? It's not about your life. If you're worried about your life, your wife, your children, your family, your friends, your neighbors, your health, your wealth, your feed, your shelter, then you've forgotten what Jesus said and you need to go back to being a follower of him for a while. If he can multiply fish and loaves, then guess what? You don't need to be worried about food and shelter, do you? If you are, then you're still at the basics. You're still a baby rolling around waiting for other people to feed you, to take care of you, and to provide shelter and provide a job and do the things that you think that you need to do. But if you're ready to move on with God, then you're ready to have a conversation with God. Then you're ready to say, God, I don't get it. I followed you. I got no food. Where's the food? And see if ravens don't come up. Hey, don't knock a gift horse in the mouth the way that God decides to provide because otherwise then you won't eat. But if God provides in any way that he chooses to, guess what? You might be surprised. You might even get T-bone. Who knows? Or manna. <laughs> but he'll provide. we got to have a relationship. Otherwise, you're going to make it into a frustration rather than a relationship. you got to have the ship sailing. Otherwise, you ain't going to get there. In dealing with other people, our stance should always be to drive them toward making a decision of their will. Choose you this day whom you will serve, whether you will serve the Lord and how he has blessed you and delivered you and provided for you and taken you all through this desert experience, how he's provided you all through this salvation experience, how he died for you, how he gave himself for you, how he said that he would send his Holy Spirit for you, how he's given you his word, how he's given you a church, how he's given you people in your life, how he's given you the health, the time, the ability to speak, and now what do you want to do? Go off on your own tangent and do your own thing? It's your will. What are you going to do with it? You're supposed to give it to him. For nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Every single day, you have to get down on your face, get down on your knees, get seated, get whatever it is, get in the word, get in scripture, get in devotionals, get in however you want to, in dynamic relationship with God in a personal way, so that you are doing what he said to do. If you're not, how do you live your day? Do you just go play? Are you just pretending you're a Christian? The reality is, grow up. We have very limited time. That's why we call it utmost videos. There isn't much time left. You have maybe a year, maybe a couple years after that, we don't know, you know, but at least one year to prepare. You got 2012 to get prepared. We'll, we'll go with this, you know, you'll see, we'll mention it at times, so, we'll, you know, you can check others parts of the sites and videos about, you know, like Armageddon uh, generation or whatever, you know, but the point is, you ain't got much time left. You could drop dead tomorrow, so I got to get as much as I can into you, as much as we can by way of the Holy Spirit speaking to me, and for both of us to realize that we don't have much time, but we're on borrowed time as it is. 
God may have extended time in order for us to get this moment together in order to share his word so that you would make the conscious choice to not do your will, but to do his will in all your ways. That is how surrendering to God begins. Not often, but every once in a while, God brings you to a turning point, a great crossroads in your life. This may be the moment in your life, your manifested destiny, so to speak, but your man-made destiny is what you choose to do with your life, whether you've decided to be some great doctor, some great lawyer, some great football star, some great athlete, some great baseball, soccer, ballet, <laughs> who knows. But woman of God or man of God, whatever it is you are, whether you've chosen to follow the Lord and to serve Him, or you've chosen to follow the way of the world and to serve it, then you're going to find that you've compromised because you can't have both. If you are not of this world and not of this kingdom, then why are you doing the things that make for God makers in this kingdom? If you're like the ultimate football star, why aren't you a missionary? Why aren't you a pastor? Why aren't you an elder? Why aren't you a deacon? If you're a rock star or you're a worship leader and you've got all this fan base, let me ask you a question. Can you hear God speak? Or are you just telling people about it? Are you walking with God? Are you talking with God? If you are, then praise the Lord. Hey, what's, what's that, buddy? <laughs> we got a lot to hear. <laughs> but if you're not, repent. Because you've been set up by the world and religious systems to fail. And if you're failing in your life, and you're not living up to your measured standards that you thought you were. If you've gone through divorces and remarriages, and you've gone through children that are rebelling, and you've gone through this, that, and the other thing, and you don't know what you're doing, and you've gotten some frustration, I suggest to you that you probably have lost your way along the way, and that you're not talking to God and listening to what he has to say. But if you are, and you've gone through all that, hey, praise the Lord, you know what? Let's talk. <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> but the reality is, is that... God uses all those circumstances of all your life in order to bring about the purposes of His plan. It's not about your life, it's about His will for your life. From that point, in that crossroads, we either go toward a more and more lazy, slow, and useless Christian life, or we become more and more on fire, giving our utmost for His highest, our best for his glory. What'll it be? What do you got to say? What more need be said? You can be a part-time Christian. I don't recommend it, but you can. You could be a quarter-time Christian. You could be a one-seventh-time Christian that only deals with God on a Sunday. You could be a good person. You could be any number of things. You could say that, you know, hey, I, I wanted to be this in the world so that I could use it for God. Okay. You have your reward. You got the accolades of man. I wonder who got the credit. Oh, but I, I made sure that I got down on a knee and I thank God for all the glory. And I gave it to him. Really, really. The dimension of the spirit and the dimension of the physical world are completely opposites. If you can be seen a man, you have your reward. What you do in secret is what you are rewarded for. For surely as much as it is the opposite of what you think it is, that's the way God operates. Your reward does not come by others seeing it. Your reward comes by only your father knowing it. So the likewise matter of what God is, as far as he is above the heavens, so are his ways above our ways and his understanding beyond our understanding. So we would not comprehend what he is and how he does things, except to identify the means with which he chooses to reveal it in his word. And it isn't about being seen of men, for there you have your reward. So yeah, you go see a great mega pastor, they got the reward. They got it now. You know, what they did in secret besides their ministry, that may be greater than you think. What they may have done behind the scenes might be greater than what they did in the scenes.
But in the scenes, you don't get much from it. <laughs> so the reality is, what will you do now? Knowing that 2012 is coming, and you have this opportunity to reach this crossroads in your life and do something different that you've never done before, to take hold of your utmost part of your being and to offer it to the uttermost God of Almighty and lay it down at his feet and say, not my will, but thy will be done. Would you walk with me today and to do that? Would we not talk each day to go through that? Can we not do the utmost for the uttermost in the videos and sharing how we could practically grab a hold of these truths and make them a part of our lives so we don't say, my will and I blew it, but thy will and I went through it. That's the bottom line. Do you really want to have your will and blow it? Or do you want to know it and go through it with God? I think, personally, there will be more religious now than ever before who will say the right words and do nothing about them. They will look the right part and have no actions inside to reflect the glory of the Lord on the outside. I think there will be many manifestations of some kind of spiritual abilities out there that have nothing to do with knowing the Lord. I think in the letters to the seven churches, we're told only one church goes in the rapture. I think that leaves six other churches behind. I would rather be on fire for God with all that I have and wrong than to be lukewarm and be right. So you see, you have a choice today. Will you press on to the full measure of the stature of Jesus Christ? Or will you be pressed out of measure by going opposite of what God intended for you to become, which was a son and daughter of God? Will you measure up yourself to the standard that he set in the Sermon on the Mount and become all God intended you to be? Or will you compromise and let yourself become the flesh that you are already and has become obvious by the words of your mouth, the actions and deeds that you do, and the things that everyone else can see except you? God, I pray, Heavenly Father Almighty, that you would touch us in such a way, that you would hear us in such a way, that you would talk to us in reality without there being some intervening force of personal manifestation of a personality like I am or that someone else may be, that we would only hear you from those vessels, but rather you would speak to us divinely by your spirit, individually by what's in our heart or even hearing you. But God, you would reach out and touch us in such a way that we would know it's you. That it doesn't have to be feelings first, and it doesn't have to be facts. But God, it has to be your will and not ours to be done. For we want to give you our lives. We can't give what we don't have the ability to do. So give us that ability by putting your Holy Spirit as a convictor on us. That you would oppress us with your Spirit. And as you do, that you would compress us by that conviction that you place within our heart to give our lives to you once more, to give over fully our heart, our soul, our mind, our being, and all that we are, that you might be glorified in the midst of us. For God, we don't pray this for ourselves alone, but we pray for all those that would likewise hear see and understand the words that we're speaking right now and the video that we're presenting and the very people that we have become to those around us that we might now shine and become the manifestation of the sons of God to all of creation as your angels watch and as we go alone one-on-one -on -one with you now as we take the time to stop doing what we're doing 
to get right with you, to confess our sins, to ask your forgiveness, to be filled with your spirit, to be convicted by your Holy Spirit, to be changed and rearranged, to be made so that we could give you in the days to come. Not a vow, not an oath, and not a promise, but that it would just be as simple as saying, yes, sir, and we would just give you our lives to live each day with you as we seek you daily, every day, without exception, to walk with you, to talk with you and to be with you first without ever doing anything or saying or being or even manifesting any word or attitude or action without checking in with you first of all. Because you're the supreme being of all, the God of gods, our Father, that we don't really understand. Help us, Father, to be your children. Have mercy upon us, O oh God, and bring us to that place where we know you like never before. Jesus, please, help us in this. For we come again to you, asking, seeking, and finding grace one more time that we might run the race that's set before us, Father. Let your spirit now abide with us. As we have prayed, let him convict us. And as we have said, let him compress us and bring us to our knees. In Jesus' name, amen.